Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. A dangerous asteroid capable of producing an explosion on the level of some of our most powerful thermonuclear weapons made a close call with our planet just a few days ago. But the most disturbing thing? We had no idea that it was there until two days after its closest approach. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to the latest Angry Bulletin. Today is going to be a fairly short episode about a topic that I discuss very frequently on this channel, and that is the danger of near-Earth objects or asteroids that happen to cross the path of Earth from time to time. And just recently, even though NASA's been doing a really good job with the help of sky watchers around the world of keeping track of these things, of detecting these objects as they make close encounters with our planet, in spite of all of this. An asteroid that's been described as being the size of an airplane made a very close encounter with our planet, passing a distance of that is roughly a quarter of the distance of here to the moon, or roughly 60,000 miles, or about 90,000 kilometers. That may seem like a substantial distance, but on the solar system scale of things, it really isn't. It's an insanely near miss. But the biggest deal of all is the fact that we had no idea that it was there. We didn't detect it until two days after this near miss occurred, which means if this object had just been a little bit off course, a trajectory just slightly different than the one that it was following, it would have hit us and we would have had no warning. And the blast would have had all the hallmarks of a nuclear explosion, including the mushroom cloud, including Including the EMP burst. The only thing it wouldn't have had is the radiation. But here's the question. If this object had hit, say, Russia, and by the way, the two biggest explosions in recent history and that have caused that is by meteor impacts have taken place in Russia simply because this country such has such an enormous land mass, would Russia have interpreted this as something other than a meteor impact, perhaps a nuclear strike, or might they simply have used that as a convenient excuse to unleash a nuclear strike against Ukraine? These are the sorts of things that we can't afford to miss. These kinds of objects are just too dangerous. And once again, even though we describe this asteroid as being the size of an airplane, in reality it was about 60 meters in diameter, a little bit bigger than the asteroid that created Meteor Crater Arizona, that means that it weighed probably on the order of a third of a million tons, or a little bit less than the mass of the Empire State Building. This is Meteor Crater, Arizona, and before I go any further, I want to thank everybody who's already pre-ordered my book, How Starship Will Save the World, and rest assured that money is going to go into supporting my North American tour. All of the details about that are in the description if you would also like to pre-order my book or support the tour. So this crater is perhaps the most obvious and tangible example of the danger of of near-Earth objects that exists on our planet. It is intimidating. And by the way, this rock that you're looking at is the size of an average two-story house. It is absolutely huge. Over 1.1 kilometers in diameter, 170 meters deep, or 560 feet, and the impactor that created this crater was roughly 50 meters in diameter, or a little bit smaller than the asteroid that just missed us. The asteroid in question is now categorized as 2023 NT1. And by the way, this animation is courtesy of Tony Dunn. Feel free to follow him on Twitter to keep up to date on everything that's going on with asteroids and near-Earth objects. So what would have happened if this object had actually collided with the Earth on July 13th instead of making a near miss? And what would have happened if this object had hit, say, 
Philadelphia. Well, let's pull up my favorite asteroid damage simulator and figure all of that out. First of all, we need to look at the force of the blast. The force of the explosion would be the equivalent of 27 megatons, or over a thousand times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. It would create a crater a bit larger than the one in Arizona, approximately two kilometers in diameter, and a depth of 423 meters. The fireball would be almost a full kilometer in diameter, and would inflict at least second-degree burns on people more than 20 kilometers away, and the fatalities close to the blast would, of course, be devastating. We're talking, of course, about millions of casualties, most of them dying in the fireball, but not all of them. Anybody who's lucky enough to survive the fireball would receive lung damage from a 208 decibel shock wave that would inflict this damage on anybody within about three kilometers of the blast and ruptured eardrums on anybody about five kilometers kilometers away from the blast. Buildings within 8 kilometers would collapse, and homes within 11 kilometers would collapse as a result of this shock wave. And then there's the wind. The peak wind speed from such an impact would be about 2,000 kilometers per hour, or more powerful than the storms on Jupiter. Homes within approximately 4 kilometers would be completely leveled by this wind, and within 6 kilometers it would feel like being inside an F5 tornado. Nearly all trees within 13 kilometers would also be knocked down. And if it were to hit just off the coast, line, the damage would be far more devastating because it would create a tsunami nearly 90 meters high. Now, if it was way out in the middle of the ocean, the tsunami would not be nearly so devastating. And of course, if it hit in a completely uninhabited area, the effect wouldn't be bad at all. This is not a planet-killing asteroid, and it probably will represent no danger to us in the future. But here's the problem. On July 13th, we came within a hair's breadth, at least as far as astronomical distances are concerned, of having a 27 megaton explosion happen at a random location somewhere on our planet, and we had no warning whatsoever. There just would have been a bright flash, something streaking across the sky, and a random location on the planet would have been completely incinerated, and a crater very much like this one would have been dug somewhere. This is is the kind of thing we can't afford to let happen. We have to at least have a little bit of warning so we can evacuate the threatened regions. So why did this happen? Well, for one important reason. The asteroid approached us from out of the sun. The sun's light completely blotted it out, removing it from our instruments and making it impossible to detect. And this is the case with a vast number of objects that orbit the Earth in a trajectory that also takes it close to the sun. As a result, there are very large numbers of dangerous objects that we still have yet to detect and have no idea when they might be coming. For example, the number of objects that potentially threaten Earth that are 100 meters or so in size, number 30 thousand, and we have only found 5,442 of them. Well, we probably found a few more since this chart was made, but still a small minority of the overall population of these dangerous objects. Larger objects like Apophis, smaller than one kilometer, but still big enough to create explosions in excess of 750 megatons. Well, we think there are about 5,440 40 of these out there, and we found 4,341. And the big planet killers? Well, we think there's 930 of those, and 912 of them have been found as far as we know. But once again, we really have no idea how many dangerous asteroids are obscured by the sun. But fortunately, the European Space Agency has an answer to these problems. It's called NEOMIR, a satellite telescope that will scan in the infrared and will be located at Lagrange Point 1 between Earth and the sun. Lagrange Point 1 is sort of a solar system parking lot that exists 
in a region of space where our gravity and the sun's gravity cancel each other out. Anything you put there will tend to stay put. And that, by the way, is where we put the James Webb Space Telescope as well. From that location, making observations in the infrared part of light spectrum, NEOMIR will detect the heat emitted by asteroids themselves, which isn't drowned out by sunlight. This thermal emission is absorbed by Earth's atmosphere, but from space, NEOMIR will be able to see closer to the sun than we can currently see from the Earth. From this observation point, NEOMIR will be able to detect any asteroids that pass between Lagrange Point 1 and the Earth that are at least 20 meters in diameter. That being the case, then, we'll get at least three days' warning before something like this hits. That won't help us with these massive planet killers. Three days wouldn't really help us at all, but for smaller asteroids, will it be enough time to evacuate? Or possibly, if we have a self-defense system in place ahead of time, we might be able to deflect them. For example, the NASA DART mission, if we had something like that in orbit, ready to be deployed at a moment's notice, we could deflect these asteroids with a three days notice, no problem. But, of course, there is a problem, because NEOMIR is currently in its early mission study phase. It's not scheduled to be launched until 2030, at the earliest by an Ariane 6, assuming that that rocket is finally in service by then. Which means that we are looking at nearly a decade of vulnerability without any way of being able to tell if these things are on their way to Earth. To make matters worse, although the dark Art mission was an unqualified success. That's the only one that we have. We don't have a backup DART spacecraft, nor are we building one, nor do we have one budgeted. As a matter of fact, because NASA is not getting the funding that they asked for this year, the vast majority of the money is going to Artemis and SLS, and nothing is going into asteroid defense, or next to nothing. Which means we are still in a period of extreme vulnerability for our planet. To be fair, the odds of something very dangerous and devastating hitting our planet in the next 10 years is very small. But at the same time, given what just happened, do we really want to continue taking the risk day after day, month after month, year after year? Smash that like, please hit that subscribe, extremely important both of those things to the success of this channel, and please check the description for various ways to support this content. And as always, stay angry about space.